Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to day three of our K-Square training session. Um, we, we have a couple more minutes before we get more participants joining us. So in the meantime, I'm just going to open up the floor to any questions. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat system. Um, to send in any questions you may have, and we can try and address that before the training session. Okay, I'm getting a few, I'm getting a couple of questions in here. So I'll wait for um, everybody to arrive and then I'll address those questions first to begin. So everybody has the same understanding and the same answer. Um, and then we'll begin on our program for today. Okay. <clears throat> So if anybody has any more questions, please feel free to put them through, and then I will address them at the very beginning of this session here today. And I think there's a two questions from Motalab Hossein FCA and uh, Ms. Minhas Shoi. Can you please answer? Yep. Okay. So uh, the first question here, if a manager runs multiple engagements, um, can team members participate where only one case where software is installed in the manager's computer? So the, the short answer there is no, unfortunately, because you need the case where software on everybody's computer to be able to access the data. Um, however, if you're okay with one user working on the file at the, at the same time, at one time, the manager can prepare the file. They can then hand that computer off to the next user to say, go and complete this using case where, and then that can go to the next computer um, and and onto the next user and onto the next user. So that's um, that one option there. Tying into the second question that's just come in, software has been installed on one computer. 
would it be possible to transfer to another computer uh, while you're Zoom? Yes, it is possible. Um, if you watch the training video from day one, I, I, will, I have, would have shown you um, how to revoke a license. And then once a license for your firm has been revoked, you can then move it over to the new computer. On the new computer, you simply re-register using the same license number, and that would then be transferred to the new computer. So the revoke and then re-registration on the new computer is how you transfer licenses. Okay. Um, one other question here, is case we're able to send bank confirmation directly to bank? Unfortunately, no, um, because there are so many banks around the world and so many different systems. Uh, we do not have the ability to do um, an automated transfer through K from Caseware to banks. What, you, what I will show you today is how to turn data and documents within Caseware into um, PDF or Excel or Word documents, at which point you can take those documents, those PDF, um, and put them into email and send it to the bank. But we don't have a direct link because we are not working with the banks to establish that link. Okay. <clears throat> so I think um, now is probably a good point here to start. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, one other question that has come in, and we have covered this, but I thought I would raise this again. Someone was asking about using Caseware for dummy data. Is that okay? Can I, um, can I use Caseware to create some dummy data and then you know, use it on a real file later on? Um, I do have to stress a couple of things here. There is no file limit. So there is no file limit to how many files you can create. If you have a team of five and you only purchase five licenses, you can create 200,000 files if you want to. Same, if you only have one license, you also can create 200,000 files. There is no limit to how many number of engagement files you can create, okay? So for this person's question, can I create dummy data and then use it on live data? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, you can. So what I have here, if I'm just gonna quickly show you, in my drive under program files x86, caseware, data. Okay, these are all my different caseware files. So I have 22 files in here and I can create as many files as I want as long as I have enough space on my computer to keep all of these files. So it doesn't matter if you have, um, if you wanna play around for the next couple of weeks before you start your engagement, you are more than welcome to, okay? All of the files that you create will then appear in this C drive program files x86 case where data location. Now, <clears throat> as for dummy data, you have two options here. The ICAB, um, ICAB uh, training data that, that I have, that has been provided to you by Afseen from the, from the um, training materials. I've downloaded a folder here, okay? You're gonna have the same folder when you download the file from that link. Now, within there, you have a few options. Uh, ABC Motor Company B is actually a dummy engagement file. So if you open it up, I've actually pre, I've already set up an engagement file with some dummy data with um, some actual work done in the file that you can play around with. That's under ABC Motor Company B folder. Now, if you say, no, I don't wanna use case where's file, I want to create my own. I want to go through step-by-step step from everything we have learned from Ken over the last three days. I want to go through step-by-step step and, and do everything on my own. That's perfectly fine. You can also do that. You can go and take dummy trial balance data or under the trial balance folder, I have also provided you with some trial balances that you can use for your own, um, for your own testing and for your own playment. Playing. So if you don't want to use your client's live data because of security, we have provided you with some um, training data in here that you can play around with, okay? So 
plenty of dummy data available to you. There is no limit, so you can create 20 dummy files from the same data here. Um, if you break ABC Motor Company or if you accidentally deleted ABC Motor Company B, you can simply go back to the link that was provided to you, download the file again, and you have a new file that you can play with. Okay. Um, one other question here, Motalib, can we download working files from Caseware at a glance? Um, if you're referring to Caseware Cloud, yes, we will cover that on Wednesday, but I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by download Caseware working files at a glance. Um, if, if, that's not, if, um, if you're not referring to the cloud, um, please elaborate on your question and maybe I can help you answer that. Okay. Okay, so um, while I wait for that question to come in, I'm just going to have a quick recap on what we finished off, where we finished off on Saturday. So I'll open up my case where working papers file from my open menu here. Um, under recent file, I'll just open up the case where file that I have, ABC Motor Company A, for the year ending 30th September 2021. Okay, so in this file on Saturday, what we last did, um, I had gone into my FSA document, the Financial Statement Areas document. Okay, within this document, I have gone into the receivables, non-current receivables section. I have determined the assertions that are applicable. I have determined the testing areas that are required. So as I mentioned, we have our procedures, our work programs are split into four categories. You have your basic substantive procedures, basic testing procedures, extended testing procedures. Okay. Uh, then we have analytical procedures, standard analytical testing, and then we have test of control. Okay. Um, from there, I have determined the level of work that is required. So for any testing that's related to completeness, we need to do all the different testing, all the, all the four categories of testing. For existence testing of non-current receivables, we only need to perform basic testing procedures, analytical procedures, and test of control. And for anything, for any testing related to accuracy and valuation for non-current receivables, we only want to test analytical procedures as well as test of control. So those are the different level of testing we want for each of the assertions, okay? This is decision was based on the amount of risk that we've identified and the RMM, the risk level that we have identified for each area here. We then justified our, our decision and we signed the, uh, the risk assessment off. Now, by signing off this risk assessment, when I now go into my non-current receivables work program, what has happened here is Caseware has optimized the work program. So first of all, at the top, you see your risk. I see the detailed table. Everything that I've just decided in the FSA is showing in here now. So Caseware, when I come in as an auditor, I can say, oh, for completeness, we need to do all of this testing. For existence, I need to do the testing. And for accuracy and valuation, I only need to do analytical procedures and test of control. Those procedures are then provided to you further down here. Okay, so your basic steps, uh, basic procedures that test for completeness. And then further down, you go down the list, you've got your extended procedures, you've got analytical procedures and your test of control. So that's where we ended on Saturday. I'm now gonna return back to the chat. There are a couple of questions here, uh, Maru, very, very quickly, what is the meaning of the various colors of tasks in the dashboard? So I'll quickly just show you in my dashboard here, you can see a number of different um, colors. So anything that has been set to gray is unavailable. So in this file, I'm not sure you've remembered, on day one, I said we don't have to do accounting estimates. So all the accounting estimates set areas has been deleted. Therefore, it is gray and there are no sections for accounting estimates. Anything that is blue is available and has not yet been started. So it hasn't been signed off yet. 
anything in yellow has been started but not yet completed. So we've completed some procedures but not all of it. Okay, and then anything in green, like my materiality, has been fully completed. So we have fully determined, fully locked down, fully signed off our materiality. I'll talk a little bit about um, signing off now, and but that's how, what the colors mean in this dashboard. So coming into this dashboard, I can quickly tell where are we at. So we haven't really done much. We haven't even done our client meetings and deliverables yet. That's where we need to start. Further down, I can say, okay, what else is missing? You can look at the colors and go, yep, this section hasn't been completed yet. This section has been completed. What is or is not available yet in this file? Okay. Um, another question here. If someone wants to transfer the C drive, yes, Mohammed Katibur. Um, so in your data folder, If you want to, you can copy and paste this entire data folder to a different file if you're transferring the license. So if this computer that I have is really old and I'm going to transfer, I bought a new computer, I want to transfer caseware there, I would basically take this data folder and put it on, onto the new, next, um, next computer. Okay. And Bollum, yes, if you do not have Caseware Cloud, it is recommended that you back up this data folder. Talk to your IT um, provider because there is, within Windows, there is the ability to go into the properties and look at the previous version. So I have actually set this up that I have previous versions saved on my computer. And this is an automatic um, backup. So at 12.08 and 2.48 each day, um, Paper will make a snapshot of my, of my data folder that I can then recover a file if it goes missing or if something goes wrong. Okay, that's something you can do, but you have to organize it on your side. Caseware does not have the auto backup option for you. Okay, uh, and FIAS sampling. Yes, we will talk a little bit about sampling today as well. So we'll go straight into our training now. I'm going to come back into the work program here. So within this work program now, you're looking at a list of predetermined procedures that has been provided by the software. So basically the software is saying, okay, you have loans and advances receivable, or you have trade receivables. Because trade receivables is material, and you say that there are risks in all these areas, and therefore you have to perform all of these different testings. Okay? Bear in mind that this software is used by everybody around the world. 150 different countries uses Audit International. So the procedure that you are seeing here is very, very general in the sense that we cannot give you specific details into what you need to test and how you need to test. What you need to now consider here is, is the procedure detailed enough for your auditor. So if I am a manager and I have a brand new um, associate, straight out of uni, doesn't, has, never done, has never done an audit before, okay? If I simply just hand them this document and say, go and, put, go and complete the receivables testing, they might read all this and say, well, what, what does this mean? Develop and document expectations. What are the expectations? What is, you know, they have lots of questions. So the general procedure here is basically a guidance. You should consider all of this. You should think about all of this. Additionally, if you want to, or if it's required, you can then right click in here and go turn this into modifiable. Modifiable will turn this whole procedure green. What can then happen is I can now come in here. I can say step one, do this. Okay, step two, do this. And then step three, do this. And then uh, we also wanna say, make sure you call up XYZ and get XYZ info, whatever you want to do. So this 
makes it a modifiable procedure that you can now detail the amount of work that needs to be done. The detail that we have provided you is very, very general because it needs to be used by a lot of different people. So I can't put the company's name, I can't put all that details in there because we don't know it. It's a very generic, very general set of instructions. You now have the ability to go in and modify that so that you can make it clearer, you can make it more specific to this engagement that you are performing. Okay, and you want to make sure that the procedures and the instructions here relate to the actual procedure regarding analytical procedures. Don't go and tell them to do a, um, a test on the, on the receivables listing uh, because it's not analytical procedure. You know, you might want to move down to the schedule part and do that within the schedule part. So this is where you can now come in and start to customize the procedures that are required for your firm on top of what has already been provided to you, okay? If you want to, or if you need to, if you look at this and say, oh, well, they haven't covered off something. For this client, we have a very, very specific need um, to do a specific testing that has not been covered off yet. I can additionally right click anywhere in here and I can insert a new procedure. So there are two new procedure inserts. Insert new procedure or insert new sub procedure. New procedure will simply add procedure one, two, three. It will just add on the highest level. Sub procedure will add one A, one B, one C. So depending on how you want to do. So if this all falls under analytical procedure, you might say, additionally, I want you to do this step under analytical procedure. But if I want a completely separate procedure outside of analytical procedures, I go add new procedure. We can add the number of different procedures here. I'm just gonna say one for now. And Caseware will simply add procedure two in here. So previously schedule was procedure two, now schedule is procedure three. So this is my new procedure. Go and take a listing of um, debtors and test against ADC records, let's just say, okay? Once again, I'm not a full-time auditor, so I, I am making um, some very, very terrible examples here, but you get the idea. The, I, here, you need to come in and decide on your own what needs to be done, okay? Um, once we've added a procedure, I can also, I just wanna add one down here. So compliance with agreements, if I go insert sub-level procedure or new sub-procedure, you will then see that 4A appears instead of procedure 5, because that's a sub-procedure, a level 1 sub-procedure. Okay, this is a sub-procedure. So that's the difference between adding the different types, the different levels of procedure. And if you have a sub-procedure like 4A, you now have the ability to add 4A1 as well. So we can go down to three levels here. Okay, and then you see 4A1. So that's the end of it. Unfortunately, you cannot add any more lower than that, but that's the, high, uh, that's the lowest level you can go. Alternatively, we also have the ability to insert procedure from content library. So from content library, we have a list of all the different procedures Caseware has. So under substantive accounting procedure, basic procedures, you have these procedures that have been hidden. Why have they been hidden? For whatever reason. So like translation, because there is no foreign currency translation, it was hidden. You have the ability to bring that back in by ticking that procedure and clicking OK to bring it in. We also have um, presentation procedures, overall evaluation procedures, all of this have been removed from the file for now, okay? Tick, and it will bring it back into the file again. Um, I have a question here. Is it possible to apply the modifications for an engagement to all future engagements? Uh, Masara, at the moment, no. That's, you have to create the modification individually. If you find that this is 
a very, very big issue. Like 90% of your audit engagements, you have one, you have the same procedure you need to manually enter. Please reach out to myself or I've seen, uh, and we can talk about creating a firm template. Now, unfortunately, firm template means that you now have to keep up the um, updates yourself. You have to make sure that all your content is updated correctly each year. It does take a fair bit more effort. So it, we do need to have a bit of a discussion to understand how much work um, it is to create those modifications um, and if whether maintaining your own file balance is more, I'm uh, sorry, maintaining your own audit procedure is more important than the actual update process. So we, that's a discussion we need to have separately. However, however, any procedure that I have added into this file, if I roll this file forward, the procedure will remain in the file. Caseware will not delete these procedures in the future in any file going forward. So for ABC Motor Company A 2022, I will still see this. 2023, I will still see this. Up until a point you choose to delete that procedure yourself. Okay. Um, and similarly, there's another question here. How, to, how do we add procedures to the content library um, from SF Hartman and Co? Um, that, that's not an option. You, if you want to add procedures to the content library, that is what we just discussed, which is a custom template, a firm customized template. And there is a lot of maintenance, a lot of state maintenance that you need to think about. So please reach out to us. Um, we can discuss the type of procedures, type of content customization you want to make, I will then give you a review on whether it's worth maintaining your own with all the work that goes around that, or it's just easier to manually add those yourself into each engagement and then retain that file going forward, okay? So I have added some procedures here while I've shown you how to modify some procedures. One thing now I'm going to also think about and look at, let me just hide Okay, so um, one thing I'm now going to look at are the risks that was involved in this file, the risks that are related to receivables. So I'm gonna click on overdue receivables here. And this will bring up the risk dialogue once more. Now, on day two, on Saturday, I showed you how we hold caseware, that this risk is being addressed in these documents. These documents as in 35101. 35101 is the audit procedure document. That is the document here, okay? One extra step that we can take, one extra step that we can take is when I click on the box here to, to determine which document addresses this risk, I can then click on the link button here. Okay, and this link button will now show me a list of all procedures that are available in this file. So remember procedure two, which was scheduled, um, compliance with agreements, significant new loans, I can pick the procedures in here. So I'm gonna show you that I'm ticking schedule. So scheduling, ensure that balances agree, test the arithmetical accuracy, assess if the loan amortization period is appropriate. Then I'm gonna click okay. And what Caseware is gonna do is says, it is addressed in these documents under these procedures. So I'm going to say okay for now. And when I come into my file here, Oops, it's not showing yet. So I'm going to save this. And I'm going to go out of the file, exit the file. And I'm going to come back into the file again. So that was 35101. That is the loans and receivables audit procedure. Okay. And now you're going to see under schedule here, you're going to see the overdue receivables risk. So 
So basically, as the manager, by linking the risk to a specific procedure here, when the auditor comes in and does the testing, they need to think about this risk here. So if they're going to ensure balances um, agree, think about the overdue receivables. There has been a risk for overdue receivables. When I'm doing this testing, I need to look at this and consider this risk as well. Okay, that's one of the advantages. The next advantage is, like I mentioned previously, if, if you look at a procedure and you say, yeah, we don't need that procedure. So for A1, I don't need that procedure. I can right click and go delete that procedure. And that would remove the A1 procedure. It will just have 4A now. Okay, so that's deleting a procedure. You can delete procedures that you think are unnecessary or unrequired through the right click delete procedure. But when you have a procedure that has link, that is linked to a risk, Caseware will not allow you to delete that procedure because it is deemed very, very important. If you don't do this procedure, if you don't test this procedure, you might be missing out on that risk. So as soon as you link a risk to a specific procedure, Caseware will remove the ability to delete that procedure for you. Okay. So here, you are, what you're going to do, um, we have only done it for receivables. The idea now is that you would go through each and every document and complete the same process. Within the FSA, you make your assessment, you determine the amount of work that needs to be done, and then you move over to the actual work program itself. You can very, very easily find the work program. While I'm in the FSA, the work program is under the work paper reference column here. So if I was looking at inventory and I've done my assessment for inventory, let's just go with, um, okay. So I've done my assessment here. So everything's medium or low. So I might just say, okay, I only need to perform uh, you no know, testing like this. Okay, I need to perform all of these testing. You can then click on the link here, the inventory audit procedure to open the audit procedure document. Okay, alternatively, I can also go back out to my document manager under inventory, that is the same document. So we've created a number of different um, shortcuts for you to get to those documents. Um, Omar, did you have a question or was that a new attendee? Okay. So now, once we have completed all of this modification and customization, we're now going to move into actual actually performing the audit work. So in here, very, very simple, um, like we have done this already on day one, when you have completed a procedure or a step, you can go completed, no exceptions. Completed with exceptions noted uh, below. Not possible to complete, yes, no, and a. Okay, so when you go with completed, no exceptions, that's it. Nothing else is required. Okay, doesn't mean this is right. Doesn't mean this is correct. If I was a regulator and I saw this, I would be making a big note here because all you have just said is completed, no exceptions. Where is the evidence? Okay, what have you done? So this here is what we call the reference button, which allows me to link a document in my file. I'll come back to this again once I have a few more documents later, but I just wanted to show you the sign off that are available first. So if you have completed no exceptions, it just signs it off with your current name that is logged in and the date that is also logged in. 
if you go with completed with exceptions noted below, then you have a cell that I can enter comments into. Specifically, any exceptions that you found. Okay, so you say it's completed, but there are exceptions noted below. So in this cell, you would type those exceptions out. We also have a warning here regarding issues. I will talk a little bit about issues later today again. So here I can then tick this and complete the same step. Lots of other different features not possible to complete. So not possible to complete, we'll just sign it off yourself. You just have to find the different behaviors um, of what each answer does. Okay, and then if I choose other. Now, for all of these other procedures, if I, if, sorry, for all of these other responses, if I want to, let's say not possible to complete, I can then untick and I will have the cell, I can enter my comment or reason why, and then retick it. Okay, so this is where you would come in to complete the work procedures line by line in here. Okay, so as you complete your work procedures, obviously you're going to find supporting documents, you're gonna have worksheets, you're gonna have um, spreadsheets, work papers, all of that outside of Caseway. Those documents can come in Word, Excel, PDF, or even pictures. So if someone said, oh, I just scanned you some images, you can say, all right, just send them to me as an image file. So once you receive those, I am going to, let's just assume we have saved those documents on my C drive. So in my C drive under the ICAB training folder, I have also created some um, draft uh, external documents. So we have some Word, we have one Word document in here. I have a PDF in here. Um, and then I'm gonna use the Excel trial balance as well. So very, very simple. Um, when I'm ready to import a when I'm ready to import a document into my caseware file, it's through a drag and drop feature. So like I have already done, I have dragged and dropped the Word document. Let me just delete this guy. And I'm going to drag once more drag and drop this into my file. See where that black line is. So where that black line is, is an indication on where the file will be saved and stored, okay? You will notice that this, the document numbers cannot be the same. So if I already have 408, the next document case will call it 409. If I drag this document in one more time, it will then be called 410. It cannot have the same document number. Now, when you drag, I'm basically picking it up on with my mouse and dropping it into my file. That is the best way to do this. When you do this, it is copying the engagement file into your data folder. So let me delete both of these once more. And you'll notice that, and you'll notice that in the folder on my desktop, the, the Word document is still here. If I go into my data folder and I show you, and I show you the ABC companies folder here, you're not going to see a Word document called engagement letter yet. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to my desktop, ICAB training. I'm going to pull that engagement draft letter and I'm going to put it into my file here. Notice how it says on the screen, copy to client acceptance and continue and see where my mouse is, it says copy. So Caseware is making a copy of that Word document into my Caseware file. And what that means is now in my data folder under ABC Motor Company, you're going to see that same Word document here. They are going to be two separate Word document. Very, very important, okay? Because a common mistake is people will think, oh, I can open this Word document here on the desktop, make the modification, and it will automatically appear in here. No, it will not, because this document is separate or different from that document now. You've made two separate copies. So if 
I want to edit the draft engagement letter, you need to come into Caseware and open it through the Caseware software. And that will open up your Word document from a different screen. You will open up a different Word document in here. Okay. That is how a Word and Excel document works. So similarly, if I want to, I can then also go into my trial balance screen here, and I can also copy in the final trial balance in here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have a question. We've got a couple of questions. Where should we attach document of independence, forwarding letter, risk assessment documents, any pre-engagement documents? So any pre-engagement documents should go into the planning phase. Anything related to risk assessment should go into the risk assessment phase. So if you look at this um, very good question there, what independence, for example, um, I don't think we have anything that deals directly with independence for the moment. Yeah, we don't have anything that deals directly with independence in here. So what you can do, um, you can use any of the folders that have been provided to you, okay? Or if you say now that that's, I don't want them, I wanna go with my own folder, you can then right click in here, go new folder. And then I can call this the independence folder. G, G. Now I'll show you that. Okay. Okay, okay. And you now have an independence folder where you can file all of your independence document. So you have the ability to manually create your own. Okay. Uh, another question here is there any guidelines regarding file name, non similar file name? Um, Asan, you can name them however you want. They just cannot be the same. That's that we don't really have any guideline. There's only a rule, and the rule is that you cannot um, have the same number for a document or a file. Okay, and I'm not too worried about that rule because it's already built into Caseware, so Caseware will not allow you to um, create one. For example, um, going back into my engagement letter, if I want to call this 408, when you try to change this to 408, and then I click OK, Caseware is going to say, no, I'm not going to let you, and then it will renumber it to a new number for you. Okay, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, it's, it's foolproof in the sense that the software will handle it for you. You can name it anything you want. If Caseware won't let you, it will give you a warning that you cannot do it. So bringing in documents, Word and Excel documents, uh, very, very simple. Once you bring them into your file, you open it through Caseware Working Papers. When you open it through Caseware Working Papers, it will launch in Word and Excel. Very basic, okay? Open it up in Excel, open it up in Word, and you would normally you, you would do, use it as you normally would Word and Excel. The next one, is PDF or image file. So first of all, let me just double check this. Okay, first of all, there are two ways to review image file and PDF. You can open up externally. So that's what I just did. You can open up externally using Adobe or whatever PDF reader that you have. That's one option. If you do this, then you are limited to all the features available within your version of Adobe. So if you have one of the premium versions of Adobe, you can edit, you can make comments, you can highlight, you can do all of that, fine. You can then continue using it that way. Alternatively, if you don't want to use Adobe, what you can also do is right click on the word, uh, sorry, right click on the PDF or image file, go into the property, and then under the general tab, viewer, you can see there is the 
external viewer option. Okay, in here I can go and choose an internal image viewer. So it was previously external viewer. Now I'm going to go with internal viewer. With the internal image viewer, what this allows us to do is open up the the PDF or the image file within Faceware Working Papers. So can you see Digital Dashboard, Document Manager, Terms of Engagement, that is my engagement letter here. Okay, so you're thinking there, why do I wanna do that? Well, the next thing I'm gonna look at is the annotation. So within this PDF here, I can now start to use annotations in my file. I'm not sure if you just saw that, but I have now started to mark up this document using the annotation tools that are available to case one. So we have some tick marks available in here. Obviously, this is your first time looking at it, so you're gonna go, oh, what do these tick marks mean? Okay, let me just zoom in a little bit for everybody, so it's a bit hard to view here. Okay, so you're looking at these and go, what do these tick marks mean? So you can hover over that to look at the um, explanation of the tick mark. Hopefully in six months time, you don't have to hover over it. You can look at this tick and go, oh, I know it means agree to invoice. This tick mark, I know it means agree to account. Okay, I can hover over that to review the person who created the tick mark and the date. Now, this is me marking up the PDF document. Okay, you can also make references. So if I want to reference this to the original um, the original engagement letter. So that's 409, that's the word document here. I can tick that and 409 will appear in here. So then I can move it down to the top here. I can also make a note. So here I can say, this is the original draft letter. And I can then mark this and put it so that whoever opens this document now, they will automatically see this, okay? And one final thing we can also do is a highlight feature. I can click on this highlight feature here and I can then highlight a specific text or a specific section within the file. I can say, please note the date. And when I click okay, you will have a highlight there. So when a, a reviewer can hover over that, or they don't, have, sorry, they just have to hover the, um, they just move the mouse over that box and they will see the comment or the note that you have made. No need to click into it, okay? If they click into it, they will now have the ability to move that, that highlight around wherever they want. So these are all the different, um, annotation tools that are available inside of Caseware. It does not just affect PDF, but if you choose to review your PDF and your Word document within Caseware using the internal image viewer, then you will have the ability to use our annotation to mark up your file. Okay, so staying on this topic of annotation, so you're now going into the audit. You're starting to do the audit work. You're gonna to have to start making notes. You're gonna to have to start um, putting in comments. I'm going to come back into my non-current receivables again. This time, I'm going to go into the lead sheet document here. Now, the lead sheet document is basically a collection or report of all the accounts that you have marked under non-current receivables. Remember on day one, when we first mapped our accounts, by mapping your accounts, you're telling Caseware what type of account it is. And as soon as Caseware knows the type of account, it can then start to put them into your lead sheet for you. For example, my long-term investments account, 116, that is a non-current receivable item, okay? Another one, I, I will use the property plan equipment because the property plan equipment lead sheets are um, probably a bit more details in here. So. Document one, property plan equipment, 1.1 splits the cost out and then 1.2 splits the depreciation account out. So looking in here, 
document one has all of that together in one lead sheet, and then 1.1 and 1.2 has the cost accounts only. These are all the cost accounts, and these are the accumulated depreciation balances. Okay, so all of these lead sheets, I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was map the account, which I was always going to do. And as soon as the accounts are mapped, your lead sheets will automatically generate for you. So while we're in here now, um, we can now start reviewing some of these data. So your account column can be, um, can be organized in alphabetical order or sorry, numerical order by account number. You can sort by amount, so lowest to highest or highest to lowest. Okay, uh, and you can also highlight a couple of accounts and by using the control key, I'm selecting two accounts and then when I let go of the mouse and I hover over that line, Caseware will total them up for you. So if I'm looking at this and saying, hmm, I wonder what is the total of my furniture and machinery, I can go and calculate that myself, or I can just pick those lines and Caseware will add them up for me. Okay, you can pick multiple lines together and Caseware will add them or subtract them for you. Okay, so while we're in here, we then now want to look at the annotation column. So within this annotation column, you have the ability to make your tick mark. Okay, agree to invoice, agree to account, agree to statement. Those are the annotations available. So all of these annotations are available under the home tab. You can also right click and go annotate and then pick whatever you want and you can make a comment in here. and that will add a note for you as well. Okay, to delete, you simply right click on the annotation or the note and you go delete. So right click, delete tick mark, and that would delete the annotation. So all the different tick marks available, you have tick marks in here to look at the name. So that's the same list. You have the ability to create a note. So this is a note from Ken and that will appear in here, okay? Um, we have the ability to make references. So if I have a document I want to reference to, Caseware will give me a list of all the documents available in my file. So you see the Word, the Excel, the PDF documents, um, any document that you have that's already saved in your document manager will appear in this list, okay? So very, very quickly, if I come out to my document manager here, let me see if I can find a probably plan equipment schedule, drag and drop that in here. That will now appear on my document manager. Wonderful. So then when I come back into my lead sheet and I want to make a link, I insert a reference, the probably plan equipment schedule appears in that list. Okay, tick the option and click OK. And you now have 1.121, the Excel schedule that I just created. So when I now click into that, what do you think will happen? It opens, it opens the property plan equipment schedule for me. Okay, that's a very, very quick way to access a document through the insert reference link, 1.121. So click and Excel keeps opening up on my second screen. So that appears in here. Okay. Okay. So that's the insert reference option. Now, one last option I'm going to show you here is the hyperlink option. Okay. This is the schedule. And I'm going to use an Excel workbook. From the Excel workbook list, you can find a list of all your different Excel documents. I'm going to choose the 1.121 Excel document that we just used, and I can actually choose the sheet 
TPE, TP and E schedule. And I'm going to just say G15, that's the cell number. When I click OK, you will now see this here. So let me delete the other one. Okay, you're gonna see that, that link there. What happens when I click this link? It's going to behave the same way like it did before. Let me just click it again. It's going to behave the same way like it did before, but this time it actually automatically picks up G15 for us as well. So let me just redo that again because it keeps spinning up on a different screen. I do apologize for that. Okay. When I click on the schedule, see how G15 cell is automatically selected for us. Okay, that is one extra step you can take to direct someone direct specifically to a cell where the um, where that evidence or that supporting document is in through the hyperlink feature and then using the Excel workbook feature and picking the location. as well as the cell number. So that's one additional thing that you can use in here. Okay, now, as I was doing all of these annotations, you'll notice that global has been picked. What this means is that anytime we reference account 148 in this file, it will see the annotations available in here. So if I take you to my trial balance screen now, account 148, and 149, if I scroll all the way to the right side here, sorry, 146 and 148, it was, you will see the annotations that I've just made in terms of the notes, the agree to account, as well as the schedule that I made there, all of this will appear in the trial balance. If I go to any other report, such as the property prior equipment cost, you will see the same annotation in here, okay? I can go to my um, general list here. If I look at my trial balance by lead sheet, I will also see those annotations there. So no matter which document you now look at or which report you now look at, if you have account 146 and 148, you will automatically have the annotation set up in there for you. If you choose to account 142, I'm going to deactivate the global, I'm gonna remove the global option. Now, any annotation I make will only appear within this document. So if I go back to my property plan and equipment uh, lead sheet, you're not going to see the annotation for 142. Okay, you're not going to see it in your working trial balance. So 142, there is no annotation in there because we deactivated the global. So using the global, consider, do I want everybody to see this annotation or is it only specific to just this document? If it's applicable to every um, line, then I'm going to activate global. And when I put in, for example, let's just say this is immaterial. Um, I believe that is not material there. So when I activate this not material here, the annotation shows up in here, but every document now where I go into, I will automatically see that other property plan, other machinery and cost is not material. Okay, that is the global feature available in here. Okay. So while we are talking about annotation, in my work program itself, or anywhere else within this work pro, uh, within K-Square, anytime you see this little circle button, uh, let me zoom in, anytime you see this little button here with the plus sign, that is the annotation button as well to reference a document. So if I click in here, I will find a list of all the documents that I have available in my file. 
okay? My Word documents, my Excel documents, my PDF documents, my other case view documents. All of these are available. So if the supporting document is in the file, what I'm going to do, I'm going to select it here. So document number 35, which is the current, uh, so the non-current receivables lead sheet document. Click OK. And that appears in here. What happens when I click that? It automatically opens up document 35 for us that says, oh, the work or the supporting document is in there. Okay, that is the annotation or the linking feature available in Caseware. I'm going to pause here for a moment. Anybody has any questions about how we are using the linking and the document feature in Caseware? Okay, doesn't look like there's any questions coming out. So I'm going to now move on to the next part, which is the issue feature. So inside of your work program, as you, as you make, sorry, I think I just saw a question here. Um, it means in the annotation, we can write a note regarding weakness that we can manage. So Kazi, um, very good question. Now, the annotation is up to you how you want to use it. You can use the note feature or alternatively, um, this next feature here called the issues feature might be of more interest for you in terms of um, the management letter. And later on today, I will actually provide you, sorry, Kazi, to answer your question. If you find any weaknesses that you want to include in the management letter, we will not use note or issues we are going to use a reportable item. And I will show you that reportable item later today. Okay, so weaknesses, do not put them in the in a note or, a, or an issue, record them as a reportable item, which we will cover off later. Okay, um, so next thing we're gonna talk about, Maruf, the review and sign off will come up a bit later, okay? So next thing we're gonna quickly talk about is the, um, is the issue feature here. So when it comes to a procedure and I say completed with an exception notice. So anytime you answer a question with completed with exceptions noted below, like I mentioned previously, you will have to enter your reason or comment. Okay. And you'll notice that if I don't enter a reason or comment, I will not be able to sign that procedure off. See, there is no little box there that will allow me to tick it. Okay. As soon as I hit enter here with my reason or comments, then the sign off box becomes available by the person who completed it. Also, one other thing that shows up in here is the issues button that says no issues exist yet. Now, if there were exceptions, Caseware thinks that you should record an issue. So to do that, you simply click on the red box and you will have the ability to enter a issue here. So um, exception noted in testing, okay? Enter your reason. So here uh, we can say uh, as part of our testing uh, or of our reading of the contract, we found that blah, 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 blah. And then you can put all your comments in here. Okay, so the type automatically is set as an audit finding or matters for discussion. You can then also choose whether you wanna make it a review note, team planning discussion, notes, any other type of issues available. So once you click okay here, Caseware then says, oh, an issue has already been created. Remember, red is a bad warning. Yellow is a still a warning, but not as serious as a red warning. Okay, so here it says issues already exist for the 
for this procedure, then I can sign this off. And a reviewer can come in and say, oh, okay, there's an issue here I need to look at. They can click on it. Um, they can click on the issue. No, they can't. Sorry. <laughs> they, can, uh, they can then go back out into Document Manager, into Document Manager, activate the issue list here, and they will find that issue available in this in this view. Okay, the, that's just one way of creating the issue. If there were no exceptions, let's just say I'm looking at this examine minutes for loan authorization. I go to the client and I say, hey, can I please get your uh, minutes? And they say, nope, I don't know. I'm not going to send it to you. I won't. I won't cooperate with you. Well, that's a problem. I cannot sign it off. I cannot say it's completed. I can't do anything in here. So what I can also do within this cell, I can right click and just choose to add an issue myself. Okay. Here, I can say client won't send minutes. Um, spoke to Ben, he won't give us the minutes. So this, Maybe I need the reviewer. Maybe I need someone to, to bring in. Maybe I need to move, put this as a note with the management. So then I can just pick this and say, okay, this is an issue here. Uh, information requested hasn't been provided. Maybe it's a reviewer point. I need them to bring in. I, I need my reviewer to look at this. So as you choose that, so it will then appear as all the different types of issues here. Okay. Within this section, you can also assign the issue to specific staff members. So at the moment, I'm only on my own, so I only, show, I only see my name. But as you have multiple team members access this case where file, um, their names will appear in this list. When you assign the issue to that user or to those users, you can assign it to multiple users. When you assign it to those users or a group of users, only those users can then change and edit this issue. So if I assign this to the managers, two of them, none of the juniors can then go in and change the issue or edit the issue. Okay, so think about who it has been assigned to. If you assign it to everyone, then everyone and anyone will be able to come in and change the issue as they see fit. You can change the priority and you can then change the status. You can put a start date, you can put an end date, you can put a reminder. When a resolution is reached, you can then document the resolution in here. Okay. One thing to note is the retain on cleanup and roll forward tick box. Both of these are ticked, which means when I run a cleanup later, it will keep this issue. When I choose to roll forward, this issue will automatically roll forward. Just keep that in mind for now. We will talk about these two uh, hopefully a bit later on today. Okay, so now I'm going to click OK now, and that's going to be a second issue that has been saved into my file. So that's another way to create an issue. Back out in my document manager, I'm going to now go into the lead sheet. So if I was testing or if I was looking at uh, my property plan equipment lead sheet and I found a problem with this leasehold improvement account, I can then right click and go add line issue here as well. And issue with the balance, I can put something in here. Okay, once again, uh, balance does not agree. Uh, material misstatement. Okay, fill in details of the issue and I click okay. And now you will see this sign here that says there is an issue with the balance. Okay, so for the reviewer to review an issue, you can activate the issues list in here, and that will show you a list of all the issues available in the file. You can drill, you can drill straight down into the issue by clicking on the document name, and Caseware will highlight the issue for you. Can you see this red warning sign here? Okay, if I drill into the other document, it will then highlight and say an issue has been created in here. So whoever has been assigned that issue can now review those issues. Similarly, if I click on this last document, 
it will then take me to the line where the issue was created. You can then double click on the issue to open up the issue pane or the issue dialog and enter my resolution or document my resolution in here. Once it has been completed, I can then say completed. So anyone who has been assigned the issue can come in and enter a resolution and change the status, but they cannot clear the issue. Okay, so this, res this issue has been completed. You will see that it is grayed out like this, but it is not marked as cleared yet. Only the person who created that issue can then come in and clear the issue. So at the moment, because we are all looking through my computer, um, I was the one who created this issue, so I have full access. But if you were not the person who created this issue and you were not assigned this issue, Caseware will actually deactivate the areas you cannot access. So it is secure in that way, in that if you open up an issue and you say, why can't I do this or why can't I do that? Look at the assignment and also look at who created the issue. So if you did not create the issue, or it was not assigned to you, you will not be allowed to. The software will not allow you to make any changes in here. Okay, there are two levels. There is the completing of an issue, and then there is the clearing of an issue. So this is completed, but not yet cleared. Once I clear the issue, once the person who creates the issue clears the issue, then you will see a tick here, and it would go from green to a red tick to say it has been cleared, which means it has been resolved and someone has cleared it. Okay, coming back out to my document screen now. So on the left-hand side here, you're going to see three columns. You're going to see all outstanding issues, my outstanding issues, which means any issues that are still outstanding that has been assigned to me, and then you're going to see all issues, okay? Further down, under non-current receivables, you're going to see different icons in here. Let me see if I can zoom in. No, I can't zoom in. I cannot zoom in, unfortunately. Let me see if I can move this over here so you can see it a little bit better. So this is number two. That means there are two issues under loans and receivables. Um, there is one outstanding issue that has been assigned to everyone. And then there are two issues in this document. So the, um, the, the indicator here tells you how many outstanding issues, how many has been assigned to you, what is still outstanding. So we have a number of different features available inside of Caseware to track who owns that issue and has it been resolved in terms of the status. Okay. Once you have all these issues completed or, or documented, at the very end of the audit, you can also come into the uh, give me one second. Let me see if I can find it. No, sorry, under general. Under the general folder at the very top here, there is all issues, my issues, outstanding issues, and any issues that are marked as a review note. So these are quick reports that you can use to quickly find all the issues in the file, any outstanding issues, and any review notes for the reviewers to isolate and look for those issues through these four documents that are sitting under the general folder at the very top of your engagement file. Okay. Moving on now to the next part, um, tag. So someone actually asked this in the file as well. So as we are looking at a specific document, there is the ability here to create tags. You can use tags for any reason whatsoever. Okay, one of the main reasons I can think of or that we advise user about is tagging a document to a specific user. So I can add a tag here and say, this is Ken's document. Okay, 
Um, and then I can just do that for a few more. Okay, and then let's just say for the receivables, that is for Sophie. Okay. And so now through the tag, you can quickly tell these documents belong to Ken, these documents belong to Sophie. So you're thinking, why do I have to do that? Why should I do this? Well, one of the things that we can do with tags is quickly filter out documents with specific tags in the sense that under the filter here, you can look for a number of different filters that has been created for you. But I can also go into the filter manager, create my own filter called under new, I'm just gonna say 10 and under edit, I can say the tag below includes the word Ken or Sophie. Okay, so if Sophie was creating her own, she can create one under Sophie. I'm just gonna create one for Ken here. And what's going to happen now, there is going to be a filter called Ken. And when I have the filter activated to Ken, Facebook will find all documents with the tag Ken and say, these are the documents you have been tagged in. Okay. When I want to see the whole document manager again, I can go back to none and I will see every document in the file and I can use pen to just filter down to my own document. So that's one of the reasons where you can use tag. You can use tag for any, any reason whatsoever. Um, some people even use it for review notes. If they want to, they can say, uh, please complete by 22nd June. And you will see there's a tag there, okay? And when it's done, you click the X button to delete that tag. So tags is a bit of a wild card in the sense that you can use it for a number of different reasons. Um, whatever those reasons are comes down to how um, creative you can get. So as we go through and complete these documents as the preparer, um, now we're gonna start thinking about how we want to sign off as the reviewer. So if I have completed all of these documents, let me just sign off this entire document here. Okay, bear with me for a moment while I sign all of this work off. Let's just assume I, I'm very, very quick. I went through and completed all of the work. So you can see I am using a group sign off, which means I sign off all the documents, all the procedures below in one go. Um, this is very rarely used in practice because in practice you do have different answers. Okay, if you use the very top group sign off here, it's going to sign off everything below with the same response. Once again, that's not a very common occurrence. So um, not a good example in practice, but I'm just quickly sign this, signing this off because I wanna show you now, as soon as I complete this document, you now have the ability to then go completed by and reviewed by. So I'm gonna say, yes, I've completed this. I will just mark it as completed by. And when you do that, your name, your initials and the date will appear in here, okay? So you'll notice that when I try to sign it off, it says, do you wanna sign off an incomplete document? So it means that there are procedures in here that has not been completed yet. So I'm gonna cancel this and let me go back up and review this document to make sure I have signed off everything. Nope, so I've missed one there. Um, let me see if there's anything else missing. Okay, so it looks like I've completed everything now. Okay, let's come back in and let's try and sign it off again.
okay? And this time, no warning. So you'll see the difference. If I had something that was not fully completed, there, there was a warning there. And once you have finished everything, you can then sign off without any warning. Same thing. A person can then come in here and say, oh, I have reviewed the document. They can then tick that and their initials and date will then sign off as the person who completed it. Okay. I'm going to click OK here. Now, by default, by default, we have two sign offs. We have a completed by and we have a reviewed by. So everybody can sign off as completed by and reviewed by, and you get this view here. If I sign off as simply just completed by, then my initials show up in here and you get one single small tick mark. This is the default is that we have two sign off person. We assume that there are two people working on this file, someone who completes the document and someone who reviews the document. That's not the case all the time. So I'm going to go into my tools tab here. I'm going to go into go options and I'm looking at roles. So under roles, you can see we have the default of two. Now, if this is a larger engagement where I have a team of different users, maybe an associate or a junior, then I have a senior, a manager, and then the partner. That's four sign-offs that I need. So I can then tick this and say, I need four sign-offs here. Okay, where you have four sign-offs activated, I can then come in and say, junior, senior, manager, and then partner. So when I click OK now, you are going to see that when I go into the sign off of this document, you now have junior, senior, manager, and partner. Okay, it is customizable on a file by file basis. So if the first file you create only needs two sign offs, great, you don't have to do anything else. If the next file has four sign offs, you can then go into tools, options, roles, and activate the number of sign-offs you need in here. Okay, you can also choose the color and the requirement. So for example, to sign off a senior as a senior role, you first must have role one completed. Or for example, if the manager wants to sign off, the manager cannot sign off unless role one or two has completed that document, which means you, have someone complete the document before the manager can review it. So for example, now if I activate this and say, manager can only sign off if any of the following roles have completed their, their job. Okay, I click okay here. Now under the non-current lead sheet, you'll see that no one has completed the, doc the document yet. Yet, if I come in and try and sign off as the manager, it says, no, I will not let you sign off because it requires junior or senior to first sign off the work. So then if the, I can then say, hey, can you please complete the non-current receivables lead sheet? The junior goes, yep, I finished it. They can sign off as the junior. Then the manager will have the ability to sign off as the manager as well. Okay, so under that tools options role is the feature here. We have a number of other security features you can look at. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on support. So that's a little bit more advanced um, features available in there. So I'm going to take a break now. It, based on my time, it's 1.22. So we're going to have a quick eight-minute break um, and have everyone come back at 1.30 local time, please. Okay. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put them through in a chat um, and, and we can pick them up after the break.
sorry everyone it was a 12 30 local time not 1 30 that's my mistake
Okay. Um, so sorry about the timing, the mix up with the timing. If anybody knows of someone who's not back yet, please send through a chat to let me know. We should wait for them. Um, I'll give everybody a couple, another minute or so to get settled back in. <clears throat> So during the break, um, we did have a couple of questions I just wanted to address very quickly. So uh, Sajidul asked, after revoking from one PC, it's, is it possible to reinstall on the same computer? So if you revoke a license from the same computer, yes, you are able to re reuse the same license on that same computer. Okay. And Fayaz here, are there any guidelines on when specific work should be completed? Um, Fayaz, I, we cannot give you a definitive timetable or uh, list because it is dependent on the auditor's decision. But if you use the digital dashboard, the format should be followed in, in this order in the sense that you would have client acceptance and continuance and you do all your risk planning and risk assessment in here first, then you move on to your risk response stages and your completion and reporting stage. Similarly, if you look at your document manager, that is how it has been set up. We have started from the top here under planning and we have worked our way down the list. We're now under the audit plans and procedures section in terms of completing all the different procedures. So now we're going to quickly look at another document in the file, um, which is the sampling document that we that we have. Okay. So under the property plan, no. Nope. Under the uh, Give me one second. Okay, sorry. Under our current receivable section, I have a document called Worksheet Current Receivable Substantive Sampling Test of Detail. So all the sampling documents that we have available in the file follows the 130 or X amount 125 uh, worksheet. So if I show you a few other sections, under inventory, inventory is 110. So 110125 is the sampling document. Current receivables is 130. 130125 is the sampling document. Similarly, if you look at property plan equipment, there is no 125 document in here. Therefore, there is no sampling doc document. And for um, Non-current receivables, we also don't have a sampling document because there is no sampling there. So you don't see the 35125 document. Now, if you accidentally deleted one of these documents, you can always go back into the document library from your library here and pick out the documents that are available. So if it doesn't exist in the library, it means we do not have a sampling document for that section. Okay. So for, uh, for current receivables, you will see 130125. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to use current receivables here. To open up the document, simply launch. And you have a number of document guidances. So Caseway talks about the guidance, explains what is the document designed for. Um, you need to be aware that the decisions that are required um, and you need to think about your own professional judgment, okay? This is a tool to help you make a decision, but it is not the definitive tool. So if you make an, an error in terms of sampling selection or sampling numbers, and then the regulators pick you up and say, hey, 
why did you come up with this weird sample amount? You cannot say, oh, well, because Caseway told me to. So this is a tool that helps you. It is not the definitive decision maker. You, the auditor, the user, are the definitive decision maker on whether or not to go with the sampling amount that we have provided you. Okay, so let's go through this document and we'll look at a few things and then I'll show you how this all works. So first of all, the um, document itself comes with a setting section here. Okay, you have the ability to print documents, uh, print content, show firm options, and there is the sample unit. So whether you are sampling based on a monetary or amount, a money, uh, a current fee amount, a value amount, or your sample is based on the number of items. Okay, whether it's number of physical items or number of transactions. Your expected misstatement. So if you're going to be using a monetary unit, will you be looking at a percentage of that balance or will you be looking at a dollar amount balance? Okay, and then the expected misstatement cap at 30%, which is the um, recommended, obviously. Um, you can lower it and you can increase it, but increasing it means you might fall foul of the regulators. Um, they might come in and say, why did you increase it over the recommended 30%? Okay, that's the um, standards um, recommendation that we have in there. Okay, so I'm going to go with number of items here and a percentage for now. Under the sample selection folder here, you, if you don't want to look at that section or if you don't want to fill out that section, you can always hide the section by closing the uh, folder like so. Now, in here, you've got to fill things, you, uh, a few things you've got to fill out, purpose of for testing, um, methods you need to consider, any procedures to be formed, what would constitute a misstatement. So you're documenting some information about your testing, okay? The first type of sampling we're going to use, it's judgmental first because it's the easiest to talk about. Sample by number of items or monetary units. So like what we have done at the top here, because I've chosen number of items, Caseware has selected number of items, but you can change it still if you want to. Um, I'm just going to go back with our default. So enter the total population and any adjustments. So if the total population is number of items is uh, 4,000, so 3,000 lines, and maybe there is an adjustment of adjustment of 10,000 items. So then case for a total sample of 2,990 items that we need to sample. Okay, because we chose judgmental, it is down to the user to fill in all the bits of information. So what is the sample size? 2,900 and maybe we made a mistake, 2,995. Okay, uh, how are you going to select the sample? Random, systematic, haphazard. Okay, sample size. You need to decide, judgmental. Oh, based on our decision, we are going to go with 30, 30 sample items. See, I'm filling all of this in manually. So maybe because this is really low, and then you comment, you put in your document, your comments. Why did we receive? How did we receive or how did we arrive at all of these decisions? Then we have a table below here, sample test results. Have you considered all of this information? Okay. Things you need to think about, things you need to consider. Projecting your misstatement. What is the total population? What is the amount of the population? And what are the misstatements in the sample? So you, after you've tested your sample, you find the misstatement in here. So for example, if the total population was uh, $3 million and the total amount of the sample was 300,000, and from there, we found $5,000 worth of misstatements, then the projected misstatement is 50,000 because we're projecting this $5,000 over the three, uh, $3 million sample. Okay, so this is how Caseware works. Um, some firms have do this a little bit differently. Um, some firms may say, oh, because we find we found $5,000 uh, 
uh, worth of misstatements in the sample, it's only $5,000 misstatement. That's the projected misstatement in the population. That is something we can argue about, but I won't do that with you here today um, because I'm not the auditor. You guys are. It's just how we have interpreted and how 99% of our users agree with us in how we project a misstatement. Okay. And what is the tolerable misstatement here? Let's just say it's 1%. So our tolerable misstatement is 30,000. And therefore, Caseware thinks, hey, because your estimated misstatement of 50,000 exceeds the tolerable misstatement, you should then create a adjusting entry, which I will talk about a bit later on. Okay, so this is if we choose to use a judgmental sampling. So if you want to use a statistical sample, here we have a table that will calculate your sample size for you. So the same thing, we have the sample selection that you need to fill in. You have the sample selections you need to fill in. Okay, then under the worksheet mode, instead of going with manual, we suggest that you go with automated by the FSA because by selecting automated by the FSA, the inherent and control risk that you have determined in there is automatically added into your file for you. So once again, how many items? Um, I, was, I think it was 30,000 items. Okay, adjustment of 10. So giving us a total of 29,9. So population there, um, total population was 3,000, okay, was 30,000. So the population materiality is 10%. Actually, sorry, it should be 300, not three. So 1% of tolerable misstatement. 300 items we can tolerate being mistake, misstated. Expected misstatement of maybe 250 items. Sorry, so you can see when I say expected misstatement of 250,000 here, it gives me a warning because the expected misstatement is capped at 30%. So 30% of 300,000 uh, is 90. So if I go with say 80 items expected, then there is no warning. Anything over the 90 cap, say 100 items, you will then get this warning because the expected misstatement cap field is set at 30%. So here, I'm just gonna drop this back down to 80 so we don't get a warning. Okay, so expected misstatement of 80, tolerable misstatement of 300. Now, required level of assurance. You do have to fill in a couple of things in here. Required level of assurance, you can go from 99 all the way down to 85. Depending on your selection here, the confidence factor will increase or decrease. Okay, depending on the confidence factor, if you notice that when I have 99 up here, the sample size increases to 840 because we require a high, higher level of assurance. If I drop this down all the way down to 85, then you have 190 samples required based on the calculation. I cannot explain this calculation to you. Um, it was determined by a group of um, very, very smart people at Caseware. This formula is set in the table. It has been used by auditors all around the world for many, many, many years. And the general feedback is that it does actually give a very good sample calculation in here. Okay, so determine your level of required assertion. With, uh, your, sorry, your required level of assurance. 99% sure, down to 85% sure. Caseware will then compare that against the inherent risk rating that you have set and the control risk rating that we have set, okay? And if you have done any other substantive testing, so if you have done your controls testing, what is the reliance? So if I am, or if the, if the test control testing came out very, very persuasive, then we will have a lower risk factor, okay? If it came out corroborative, which means, yeah, it's, it's okay, 
uh, we tested and some of it worked, some of it did not work. So it's corrobor corroborative. Then you have a lower risk factor and therefore you need a um, higher amount of sample size. Because there was no testing whatsoever, then you need a higher amount of samples. Okay, and if you choose minimal, it's still not great, but it is still better than none, and therefore the sample size does decrease slightly. So if you look at presentation here, um, based on the assertion of presentation, if we have 119 samples, if I say there were minimal reliance on our test results, then it drops down to 150. So I cannot explain to you how we get to 150, but I'm, exp I'm showing you how this table works in terms of you filling out the required level of assurance, you filling out the reliance on your controls testing or any other uh, substantive testing, and Caseware will then provide you a sample size and based on the balance, the sample interval. Okay. Then under the professional judgment checklist, so I've been talking about this before as well, professional judgment. We have given you what we think should be the sample size and the sample interval. Now, you need to think about from your perspective as the auditor, as the, as the expert, you need to look at this and say, yeah, okay, I agree with Caseware or no, I do not agree with Caseware. So if you don't agree with Caseware, you cannot rely on these sample sizes, then you may have to go back and use the judgmental option instead of the statistical option. Okay, so go through all of this. Caseware is asking you a number of questions. Before doing this, have you considered all of these factors? So you need to answer yes, or you should be answering yes in here. If you're answering no to any of this, you need to think about, can I rely on the sample size and the sample interval provided by Caseware? Okay, and then simple, uh, same thing again, have we documented the sample test result? Have we considered the correct amount of samples? And once we have done that, we can look at the total population. What did we test? If we tested $300,000 worth of testing in here, what was the misstatement? And then Caseware gives you the projected misstatement. If the projected misstatement is higher than the tolerable misstatement, then you'll be asked to create an adjustment. So if the projected misstatement was say $1,000 out of the 300,000, then we do not require any adjustment because the projected misstatement is only $10,000 and we can tolerate up to $30,000 here. Okay, and then you have your conclusion. I am satisfied based on the judgment made, we are sufficient and it meets the purpose of our testing. Okay, so I have a question here, Fayaz. Uh, how to carry out sampling on control testing population? Fayaz, the, the population itself, this population itself, you can change the population amount for whether it's control testing or substantive testing. Okay, and another question here is, can we change the currency symbol from dollars to BDT? Yes, you can. Um, that is done under the tools options feature, under currency, because it has been set to use regional setting, whatever your computer region setup is, it will have that amount. You can just change this to custom and you can type the amount, the, the currency you want in there. And when we click OK, it will have that for you. Okay. So now we have found some misstatements. We found some errors. So we're going to move into our adjusting entries, okay? Under the adjusting entry screen, I can now post an adjustment to 
come in here, you simply click on the adjusting entry button. And then we're going to click new to create a new entry. So for adjusting entry, we go by numerical order. So automatically case where every time you click new, case where it's going to call it entry number one, entry number two, entry number three, and then entry number four. It'll just go down the list, okay? Internally, the firm can decide on a naming policy. I have seen this happen before. People, uh, firm, the firm manager might say, no, I don't want you to just use one, two, three, four. I want you to put in some type of code in here. So if you don't agree with Caseware's number, you can type over that. For example, this entry, instead of number four, I want it to say KC-4 as a way for me to identify who created that entry. Okay. So by typing in here, Caseware will then renumber that entry for you. So now you have one, two, three, KC-4. Okay, when it comes to this screen here, you can now then choose to delete any entries you want to. Okay, and you can also then choose to renumber any entries you want to through the renumber button, but I find it that it's easier to just type it into this field here. Okay, you then have the ability to scroll through your entries. First entry in the list, next entry in the list, previous entry in the list. So you're looking at this entry number here. If I go next, that goes up to two. If I go next, that goes up to three. And if I go next again, KC-3, okay? So this takes me to the last entry. There is a list here. I can quickly just pick out an entry that I want to look at. Okay, when you first create an entry, your name will appear in here as well. Based on the um, period type, because this is a yearly audit, so I leave this entry as a yearly adjustment. So it's going to adjust my yearly balance, okay? The date is really important. So if I chose, let's just say 1st of September, 2021, where does that date fall into? It falls into my current year time period. Yep. So by saying 1st of September 2021, I will be adjusting the 2021 balance. If I change this to 2020, then Caseware will adjust the prior year balance. Okay, similarly, if you change it to 2019, then it will become a prior year balance as well. So I'm going to make this a current year adjustment, meaning it will adjust my current year balance. I can refer to any document. So this is my document list. Remember the engagement letter 409 that appears in here. So any document you bring into your document manager will appear in this list as a supporting document to this adjustment. Okay, type of adjustment, we have normal adjusting, reclassifying, unrecorded factual, unrecorded projected, unrecorded judgmental, and eliminating. Do not use the prior period or anything under eliminating. These are the only adjustments that you should be using, okay? The rest do not apply to what you are doing. So just use from normal adjusting down to eliminating if you have any consolidated and um, engagement. Okay, so here I'm just going to quickly choose a unrecorded factual for now because we have found, um, sorry, unrecorded projected. So we use the sampling document from before. We create, uh, we, we went and tested a sample and based on the sample, um, we projected that the adjustment was 20,000. So I can now tell case where this is an unrecorded projected misstatement for now, okay? Description. So in your description field, please fill out the details of this misstatement and reason for the adjustment. 
really, really important. Fill out with all detailed available. So make sure you are as detailed as possible. And I'll explain that in a moment, why that's the case. Okay, moving on to this next uh, option here, we have the ability to repeat this adjustment in the future year. So you have a recurring option here. If I activate the recurring option, when I roll this file into 2022, Caseware will automatically create the same adjustment for us. I don't have to go in and adjust, create this adjustment again. It's automatically created, okay? If you are going to create a recurring adjustment, go into the advanced screen. And one thing you can consider is excluding the amount. So if this is an adjustment that needs to happen every year, but the amount may change, I can say exclude the amount, and then I will come in and key in the adjusting amount later on. I can also then choose to how long this adjustment should keep going. Should it keep going every year? There is no end date. Should this adjustment only happen for the next five years? Or should it end by a specific year? So maybe 2027. Okay, if it does, then it will run to 2027 and then stop happening again. Okay, there is also the ability to reverse this adjustment. So if this adjustment is for one year and then next year I want to reverse the exact opposite amount, Caseway can then automatically do this when you roll this file forward into 2022. But now I'm just going to select none because we don't want any recurrence. Okay, so in here, we can then now start adjusting our trial balance. So based on the account that we found, maybe it was something in um, long-term investment. Okay, I can click on the number account number field here. I click the drop down and Caseware will bring up my, a list of all my accounts. So under long-term investments, I select, and Caseware says, okay, here is the account detail. What is the total amount of the account? So I'm gonna say $20,000. That's the adjustment, okay? If the account does not exist yet, you can then also type an account number in. Caseware is going to say, the account does not exist. Do you want to recreate it? I can say yes, and then we can enter a name for the account, okay? I'm not gonna do that, but there is the option to very quickly create a new account that, no, that does not exist in the file yet. So in here, uh, we can then choose the balancing account or the other side of the adjustment. So I'm gonna choose salaries and benefits here, just as an example. And when you choose the account, Caseware automatically tries to balance it out for you. I did not type that second 20,000. Caseware automatically balances out for you. So if that's correct, great. I can just close this now and put the adjustment through. But if it's not, you can then come in and type over that amount yourself. Okay? So if it's just $10,000, you can put that in. And the adjustment is now unbalanced. So if I choose to close out of this now, Caseware is going to ask you, do you want to leave the entry unbalanced? Yes, we will close that out. If it's no, you can then come back in and change that amount later on. So obviously you do not leave an unbalanced journal, but let's say we don't know the other side of the account. I'm, I'm waiting on someone else to come back to me. I can leave this as it is for now, but I want to come back and change it later on. Okay, really, really important. So once you have the other side of the account, you can come in and I can say, this is payroll clearing. I need the remaining 10,000 to go in there. If that's not 10,000, you can then say it's 5,000. You can then add an extra account to finally fully balance it out. So you can add as many accounts. There's no limit here. 
how many accounts you want. What ideally happens is that you want one adjustment for a specific reason. So you don't just group all your adjustments into one entry because that would be really confusing for everyone. You would create different entry document, um, different reasons for that adjustment. Okay, so this is an unrecorded journal. If I come into my trial balance here, under the adjustment screen, you're not going to see any adjustments yet. So I'm going to quickly come into my adjustment here. I'm going to go back out to adjustment number one. And let me just quickly create an adjustment here. Okay. And this is a normal adjustment. So now when I go into my trial balance screen, you're going to see you're going to see the $5,000 adjustment here for employee deductions payable, as well as life insurance, uh, sorry, as well as advertising and promotion. So there you go, $5,000 here, $5,000 here. Okay, that's because it was set up as a normal adjusting. You can choose reclassifying or eliminating and that would go ahead and adjust your trial balance now. If you leave it as unrecorded, it will not change the trial balance yet. So unrecorded journals are proposed journals, which means I now need to send this information to my client. I'm gonna send it to them and say, hey, here are the adjustments I think you should put through your file, okay? How do we do that? You can pull up an email, you can pull up, pick up the phone, you can send a text message, or using Paceware, under the completion folder, identified misstatements, you have uncorrected misstatements, uncorrected factual, projected, or judgmental misstatements. Okay, what this means is if I open up this here, you will get the adjustment that we have just put through. Remember, I said in your description, please fill in as much information. That description will come into this document here. Okay. You can also open up the projected misstatement document and show a list of all the account numbers, account names, and amounts adjustment. Remember, fill in all the information here. Why do we want to do that? I can now right click in this document, save as a PDF. I'm going to save it onto my desktop and click OK. And now on my desktop, I have this unrecorded misstatement projected PDF in a report here, okay? All I have to do is attach it to my email and I can send it off to the client and say, hey, uh, James, this is a list of adjustments that we have identified and we think you should put through your account. Please come back with me and confirm if this is correct. And if they say, yep, it's okay, I have accepted all these adjustments into my accounting system. Sorry, I just accidentally closed that. Let me reopen it. They come back and they say, yep, I have accepted all those adjustments that you've given us um, and put them through my and process them through my accounting system. I can then come into the adjusting entry screen, pick out the unrecorded journal that we were talking about and automatically change it from unrecorded projected to normal adjusting. And once it's been set to normal adjusting, you'll notice that the misstatement automatically chose projected for us as well because I went from unrecorded projected to normal adjusting. If you go from unrecorded factual to normal adjusting, then the misstatement type will be factual for you. Okay. So once it has been set to normal adjusting or reclassifying or even eliminating, Caseware can then come into the trial balance screen here and you will find the 
you will find the adjustments to my long-term investment account, $20,000 here under the adjustment. And employee deduction payable, retain uh, dividends, as well as the salaries and benefits. Okay, so that once it goes into, once it goes into your normal adjustment, it will then come into your trial balance. Now, what happens if one of my adjustments was unbalanced? So if I turn this into an unbalanced entry, then your trial balance will be unbalanced as well. Can you see this error down here? Under my adjustment column, there is a $5,000 unbalanced. That then rolls into my final balance for the year, which is also out by $5,000. Okay. Uh, Subrata, how to identify the total number of adjustments made in the TB? So in your working trial balance screen, you can quickly look for the adjustment um, column here and look for the adjust the adjusted amounts. Go into your adjusting screen here and look at all the different adjustments that you have set up. Or under my document manager, if I come into the uncorrected misstatement here, you'll see that there are no unrecorded misstatements yet. But once we can also then go into the adjusted journal entries, and you will see a list of all the entries that went from unrecorded to final. Okay. Um, and then we have all adjusted journal entries, 335.20. This will give me a list of all the journals that are in my file. That's one that you can use to Brata to identify the total number of adjustments. Okay. Um, Fayez, we so the sampling module that we have that I just shown you only shows the number of transactions that are needed to be tested. We do have a separate tool that can allow you to pick random samples from a um, from a population or from a sample of transactions or list of transactions. Um, that is a bit more of an advanced uh, document that we do not have time scheduled for today to look at. What I can do over the next month or so, and um, the plan is that we will have um, follow-up sessions, Q&A sessions, um, and if you can raise this question again, maybe later in the future, the potentially what I would do is I would then record tip vids, like quick videos, 10 minutes, five minute videos on very, very specific topic like this to show you how to use those documents. Okay, but before we reach that level, I do require a bit more um, competency from you guys in terms of using caseware first before we delve into those type of documents because they are a bit more advanced and a bit more complicated than, um, than the basic documents that we're looking at here. Okay, so yeah, do put that down, do jot that down as a note, but if I told you how to use it today, um, <laughs> it won't make a lot of sense because a lot of things do require a bit more of an understanding of case rest first. Okay, so we have now found some um, adjustments we need to make, we put those through. What we're now going to look at is reportable items. So as we were doing our testing, someone asked before, what happens if we found misstatements? What happens if we found issues we need to raise with the team of management? What happens if we find weaknesses in the audit? Okay, you can use notes, you can use issues, but, but, when I show you this next module here, you are going to say, yes, let's use reportable items instead of all the other stuff that we've looked at so far. So like we mentioned on Saturday, um, we have three modules that run in at the top here. You have your risk, which is the red item. You have your controls, which is the blue items to document all your risk and controls. When you find 
an issue that you need to raise with the management team, you are going to create what we call a reportable item. A reportable item allows you to document weaknesses or issues that you have found that you need to report to those charged with governance or the management team. So in here, you are going to create a new reportable item, okay? So before we go into that, I'm going to just pick out a couple of risks. So the risk that we added was overdue receivables, okay? Based on uh, the overdue receivables, we then went and tested competent staff. So one of the policies or one of the controls that was created was that they have created a competent staff policy um, and the client had said, we're going to follow these, this uh, policy when we hire staff and we deal with training. Now, very nice, the policy was there, etc. okay? But then when you went through the control testing or when you walk, did a walkthrough, you noticed that the policy was not followed by anybody. So nobody followed the policy, nobody was following the training program, nobody was following anything. So now there is a reportable item because it's a weakness that we found. So we can say this item here is competent staff policy. Based on our observation, no one was following the policy. Okay. Where was the source? You can then link this to your document manager, maybe the walkthrough documents uh, in terms of your walkthroughs, control design here as part of your um, testing for receivables, control design testing for receivables. Um, based on that document, that's where we found that no one was following the policy. Okay, has it been addressed? Yes. We actually sent an email to the client and said, hey, you guys are not following the policy. So I can then drag and drop that email in a PDF in an emailed file straight into my document manager. And then I can click in here to select that document and say it was addressed in this email or in this PDF or in this letter. Okay, so that's where you would set the address. So now we're going to make recommendation and responses. So in here, I can click on this and go create a new recommendation or you can import from risk base. Okay, I'm going to choose create new item. And what, what is the recommendation? All management staff to undergo um, training on XYZ. So we recommend that you ensure all staff does whatever you want in here. Okay, that's your first recommendation. You can then add more recommendation as you need through the create new, or you can delete any recommendation you don't think is required anymore. Okay, the reason without training Staff members are making mistakes in all these areas. Okay, and then roll forward. So here I can then link it to a risk. So I'm going to link this to the control of competent staff. And because competent staff is also linked to a number of different risks, okay. I, I will just quite quickly highlight maybe general IT controls and overdue receivables. So I'm going to say this reportable item is also linked to a specific risk called general IT controls and people were not following this control and overdue receivables. So you have all of this linked up. Now, when they are all linked, you'll notice very nicely when I hover over IT controls, you can see IT control is linked to competent staff the control itself and the competent staff policy reportable item. See how they are highlighted on the right hand side. If I hover over the competent staff reportable item, you can see the risk and the control is also highlighted for you. 
Okay, we have another reportable item that I had already previously created fictitious or incorrect sales. So during the testing, we found a number of incorrect or fictitious sales. Where was the source? So the source was in my approval policy walkthrough when I did my revenue approval policy walkthrough and the invoice matching walkthrough. We found all of these problems with mistakes in the, um, in the sale. Okay, but where has it been addressed? It has been addressed in these procedures and in the walkthrough documents. We have documented all of this information. Then, Caseware says, what are your recommendations? So in here, I've created a number of different recommendations. Ensure sales are classified and recorded correctly. We're recommending you train all these staff in doing so and so and so. Okay. Uh, ensure procedures for proper shipping and billing. We recommend blah, 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 blah. Now, this, this procedure actually came from, I didn't actually write that. I don't have the, the, the knowledge to write all of that information. That actually came from our risk space. So if I just quickly show you the risk space here, um, and I quickly come into management letter points, Okay, um, I'll expand all. And what was the name of the recommendation again? Sorry, give me one sec. Uh, and billing. Okay. So here we go. I found this established procedure for proper shipping and billing, which I copied from risk base. When you click into it, Caseware will give you this body. I basically copied that text. This text here, I copied this, and then I went into my reportable items and pasted it in there. So that's because I looked at this and say, oh, it works for my file. You don't have to use risk space. It is an optional item, but if you are not sure what you need to look at or what you need to put in here, this is something we can provide you in terms of a recommendation. Okay, you don't have to copy the whole thing as well. You can look at this and say, ah, thanks for giving me a bit of idea. I can now come in here and I can then edit whatever I don't think is required. So you can still edit this recommendation to fit your audit. So then we click OK and we put all of that in. So my file here, it, it's added itself a few times. So that's, that's a bit weird, but um, we'll leave that for now. And and I'm going to save that by clicking the OK button. Okay, and that saves the work that I've just recorded. So you're thinking that, why do I have to go through so much trouble? Why can't I just make a note? Or why can't I just create an issue? Well, by, re by recording all your reportable items inside of case, we're using that module. First of all, I showed you that you can link everything up together. I can look at one item here and see the risk that it affects, the controls that it affects. I can see a nice little relationship going on here, okay? More importantly, if I now come into reports to those charged with governance, document 360, management letter report, just like our risk report and our control report, we have a report that shows you all of the information that we have found in this engagement. There's a report there that says, these are all the points you need to raise. If you created notes or issues, you need to go and find it individually. This picks up all of those reports and all of the information, date identified, who identified, reason, what does it affect, where are the sources, where has it been addressed? And then I can mark it off and say, yep, I agree to all this, or I can sign them off. Okay, when you sign off this document, I then come down to the next document, the management letter. In the management letter, 
you have, or we have provided you, a list of, uh, sorry, a very generic letter for, for, the, for you to address the management team, okay? You might look at this and say, nah, the wording's not great, or I don't, I don't agree to it, I don't like it, fine. You can change, or you can edit the letter in here. You can type it in yourself. If you don't want to, you can also export this out to Word and save it in Word and edit it in Word because it's a bit easier. What's really great in here is that a lot of that information that you filled out on day one, remember the name, the address, if you filled in a contact name, all of this will automatically fill in your letter for you. So I don't have to go through and manually type them over and over again. Okay, my year end date, the company name, this is a yearly audit. All of that is filled in for you. More importantly, this is the best part here. Detailed audit findings. We have previously reported the following items, any items that needs to be included. Okay, nothing in here just yet. So I'm going to now click on the refresh button and you'll notice this is the whole reason we want to use the reportable item. Because by documenting it as a reportable item, Caseware will automatically put this into your management letter for you. Everything you documented, competent staff policy, based on our observation, no one was following the policy. All management staff undergo training. We recommend that you, you ensure all staff does blah, 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 blah. Okay? Fictitious sales or incorrect sales? When our, from our testing, we found a number of incorrect or fictitious sales. We recommend that you do training for this. We recommend that you establish a procedure. All of this has been documented in the file because I typed it once and I tell Caseware to generate and save it into my file for me. Okay. And so going through this, Instead of having to then type that out all over again, we can save this in this document. I can then go file, export to RTF, rich text format, export it out to Word, PDF, export it out to PDF. So all documents, not just the management letter, all documents with inside of Caseware has that, uh, has that ability to either export to RTF or export to PDF. From the top here, I can also right click and save as a PDF if I want to, and that will turn this management letter into a PDF that I can send out very, very quickly and very easily. Okay. Um, let me just quickly look at something here. Okay, so we're going to step away from the normal procedure here for a moment. I just realized that a lot of people have one license and they're talking about switching users and changing users. So one thing I never actually talked about was changing the identity of the user. So like I mentioned, um, by signing off on a document, my initials show up in here. Okay, so if a different user uses my computer and they also want to sign off, if they simply just sign off like this, it's going to show up as KC as well, which is incorrect because they, their name's not KC. So under the tools menu, you can use the change identity feature. And basically um, yours is gonna be different, but let me see, yep, there we go. I'm gonna call this person Dumbledore. So Dumbledore is also a user in this caseware file. And here I have the ability to then change that user to Dumbledore and click OK. And now when I choose to sign off as the junior, notice that my identity is Dumbledore. So I can then click on junior and that will sign off as DD. Okay, if you need to Add new users, simply come into the change identity feature here, under manage, new, 
and you can enter their user ID, maybe Sophie. Okay. Just call it Sophie Monk. And you now have SM here. So when I then sign off, I can change my identification from Dumbledore to Sophie Monk. And when I come in and sign off a different level now, they will come up with the SM initials. Okay, that's for those of you who are sharing one computer or are sharing licenses. You don't have to keep transferring license over to a different computer. You can have one computer with the caseware software and change identity that way to allow a specific user to sign off as themselves. And this is really important um, that you have all the different identifications because if you have the wrong identification or different, the same identification that all signs off as KC, um, maybe the partner's initials is KC and it's got completed by, reviewed by, partner, manager, or KC, then as a reviewer or a regulator, I'll come in and say, hang on, did one person do this work or did everybody you know, sign off as the partner? Because that's really unsafe. So changing the identity here allows you to tell Caseware who is the user signing off that work. Okay, um, one last thing I'm going to quickly talk about is our, uh, our constellation. So for those of you who are looking at the document manager screen here or anywhere within Caseware, you will find a constellation button available. Now, this constellation button is going to be very different for you if you're following along, um, but I just wanted to show this to you. This is something you can use towards the end of the audit, okay? This constellation feature is going to tie your entire caseware file together. So looking at this file here, I can quickly tell operating expense and revenue have the largest balance in my file in terms of the FSA, the financial statement areas, okay? Operating expense, if I click into it, it will tell you 2.274 million planning balance, 2.13 final balance. In the prior year, it was only $304,000. If you hover over that, can you see the 600% plus 600%? That means from prior year, from 2020, to 2021, it grew by over 600% from 304,000 to 213, 2.13 million. Okay. Similarly, revenue dropped by 680%. So went from 297,000 in the prior year to 2.3 million in the final year. That is the 680% growth in the balance. If you choose revenue, you can see all the different uh, control risk or, in, or inherent risk affecting revenue. We then look at all the different relationships. So looking at the legend on the left-hand side here, anything that is purple is the business cycle. Anything that is red are the risk. Anything in orange, uh, sorry, in blue is, are the controls and then green are the reportable items, okay? So what this means is for revenue, it, it is immediately affecting by all of these risks. So the first layer of risk affecting it. It is also affected by these um, controls. So the approval controls, there is a match invoice to shipping controls, and there is a competent staff control, okay? Um, you have the reportable items. So how this is linked through approval to revenue uh, recognition risk to the incorrect sales uh, control reportable items. So we can't really tell you what to do here in terms of the information that is provided. We just think that it is a great little feature that allows you to have a look at your audit from a high level view and see all the different relationships. Now, this may be very, very messy. So what I can do, instead of looking at direct and indirect consequence connections, 
I can just show me direct connection. So immediately, what is automatically and immediately linked to revenue? All these risks, all these controls, and this business cycle. If I want to see further connections to all of these items, I can show the further connections. But if I only want to see from revenue, it goes to the revenue receivables and receipts business cycle. If I want to see all the relationships linked to revenue receivables and receipts, click on that and you will see all the items that are linked to revenue receivables and receipts. Okay. If I want to see the overdue receivables risk and all the items that are linked to it, click into that and it will highlight the relationship, the direct relationship, not the indirect relationship. Okay. You can look at the different views. So here, I want to look at just all my risk, just the FSA, including the two largest FSA, my reportable items, you can split them up that way. Or you can look at this and how it quickly links to each other. So if I click on, for example, if I click on borrowings, so borrowings isn't linked to anything else. Okay. If I clicked on, say, uh, give me a second in here. Yep. So inventory. So inventory has an inventory risk. Let's try it again. Inventory has a list risk for inventory clock. Um, it is linked to the inventory business cycle. It is linked to the competent staff control. That's one way to also look at it. So different views available to you. And what's also really important in here are the different levels of the audit. So based on planning, at the moment, I'm seeing everything. Everything, including material, immaterial, or zero balance items. So from planning here, I can say, just show me material FSA, risk and control. And that will just hide the immaterial items in my file. So it's a more simpler look in here. Okay, risk assessment, you have all of these different areas. Risk response, we have all of these different views. Completion, partner and manager review. So using this, we can now, under the constellation, I can have a quick overview of how my file is linked to each other. But also, when I come into my dashboard now, I can also see which area has been started, which area still needs to be completed, which area is not available to my file. Those are all the different dashboards that we have available to you. Okay. So, um, Looking at the time here, we have reached our schedule, planned schedule ending. Um, I do have a few other things we need to go through in terms of completing the audit. There is a number of documents in here that we haven't looked at yet. And then we need to talk about year end close, cleanup and lockdown. Now, unfortunately, I think that will take another hour, maybe hour and a half which I don't want to take up everybody's time because we do have a lot of appointments. It's a Monday, everyone's really busy. So I'm gonna end the session here today uh, with a Q&A session. So anybody has any questions, feel free to put them through. Um, I will take this offline with Afsin. We will organize, hopefully in another maybe three to four week time, we, I would like to organize another catch up session with everybody, maybe for two hours, two and a half hours, where you can come in, and ask any questions, and then we will look at finalizing the audit. The idea here is that in the next three to four weeks, we will give you an opportunity to go off and perform a, uh, a, a test case on yourself. You can go and use the file that we've given you, you can go and use a live file, and basically by in three to four weeks time, hopefully you would reach the part where you need to look at completion, then we can come back and look at the completion steps and the completion topic. Everything I have shown you today should get you to the end of all your testing, which is the bulk of the work. And then we can look, we can talk a little bit about finalizing the audit in that final follow-up session. Okay. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, I'm going to now move over to the Q and A part. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to 
pop them through. Um, if you have to run and go to a next meeting or different meeting, thank you for your time and we will talk soon. Um, those of you who have cloud and smart things, we will be talking again on Wednesday. Please, please, please join that session. In that session, I will be showing you how you can share your files on the cloud, how you can work with multiple users in the same engagement. And all these users can be sitting at home, sitting in a different country if they want to, and the information will automatically sync with each other. So if you have subscribed to Caseware Cloud, if you have subscribed to SmartSync, please join us in that session. Anybody who is interested with that, with, with SmartSync and Cloud, please feel free to also join us. It is open to everybody. You don't have to be a subscriber to join it. Um, you can come and watch and maybe help you decide whether it's suitable for you or not, okay? Um, so, thank you for your time today. I'm going to now look at a question here. Is there any option to assign tasks to a specific um, person? So, the, from a document point of view, there is no specific task assignment um, feature, but what I showed you previously was the tag feature that we have here. So, for if you can see, in here, I have a few documents that I have assigned to myself under Ken, and I've assigned a few documents to Sophie using the tag feature. You simply just click the tag and then type the person's name, and that would appear in there. That would be the closest feature we have to assigning documents, um, but if for, we don't actually have a specific tool for that. Okay. Wonderful. That's so. Um, any other questions coming in? Please feel free to type them through, and we will hang around for a few more minutes. So, for those of you who will not be joining us on Wednesday, uh, thank you for your time over the last three sessions. Uh, really, really appreciate your time and attendance. Please feel free to um, play around with the software, get to know it, understand it, and do not fear the software itself. Um, it is, you've seen over the last three days how helpful it is um, and how it will help you, uh, you know, create a more efficient audit, um, a faster audit, a more clearer, um, a more complete audit. Okay, so I'm going to put my email up here on my screen at the moment. Any, um, any questions that are coming through, please feel free to email myself. Um, also CC up theme in the email that you're that if you have any questions or any issues with the installation. Um, I know I've talked to a couple of people here. If you're still facing those issues, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we will get to the bottom of any problems that you face. Also another email that you can um, email is Singapore underscore info at caseware.com. That is our Singapore help desk team. They are also able to help you in any scenarios where I'm not available. Um, if to be complete, you can email both both emails as well as a team's email, put them all in there and the appropriate person will get back to you with any answers that is appropriate. Okay. So I'm just looking through here, uh, no other questions coming in. So, Okay, thank you everyone um, for your for your time. Okay, so if there is no other questions coming in, I will now end this session. So it was really good to talk to everybody. Um, today's recording will be emailed out to you shortly from our team. Um, for those of you who are also not joining us uh, tomorrow, on Wednesday, please bear in mind, we have another Q&A session coming up on Monday, 
uh, next week, Monday the 28th at 11 o'clock uh, local time. So there's a one hour session for a Q&A session. Anybody has any questions? If you have plans to play with it over this week and you find any problems, any questions, please feel free to join us in that session and we can also talk a little bit about, answer any of your questions, yeah? Okay, so thanks everyone. Um, and I will end the session now. So uh, as I've seen saying in the chat, if you don't get any recording, please email, please reach out to I've seen. Okay. So I'll end the session now. Thank you very much. Have a good